I'd like to welcome this group. There are nearly 160 of us who signed up for this weekend, one of the largest groups we've had for a volunteer conference. Um, the room holds about five more people. Um, so we'll be looking to expand our venue next year. Um, so you are key volunteers and reunion planners um, representing the Mount Holyoke Fund as well as your class. And to start it off, I'm Jane Zimmy, class of 1974. Um, for any of you who might not know me, and my goal for this weekend is to meet each and every one of you. I can't tell you that I'm going to remember your name. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the Mount Holyoke Fund, along with Casey Accardi and Sally Donner. Um, raise your hand. And will the 16 of the 17 members of the Mount Holyoke Fund Committee um, just either raise their hand or stand up? We are ecstatic um, to have you here. And we have... We have these little white tags that say Mount Holyoke Fund Committee. Um, so I would like to turn it over to Melissa, um, who's representing the Alumni Association side of the house. So thank you so much. We're so happy you're here as well. I'm Melissa Russell. I'm the chair of the Classes and Reunions Committee. And so I also have a committee of members here this weekend. So if you are on the Classes and Reunions Committee, will you just stand up or wave? And then we have other um, committee members and board members from the Alumni Association that are here to support the Classes and Reunions Committee and this conference. So if you'll just stand up or wave, that would be great. So um, the goal of this conference this weekend is to provide all the information you'll need to know to be an effective volunteer. This series brings together the Alumni Association and the Mount Holyoke Fund volunteers to collaborate with each other and gain timely insight into the current environment at Mount Holyoke. Volunteers should leave this weekend with the education, information, contacts, and skills needed to move forward in their respective roles. So thank you for being here. We're really excited to get started. So we're all here Whoops. because we love Mount Holyoke. In fact, given the weather and a show of hands, how many people arrived by plane to come to this conference? So a special welcome to you because my guess is all your plans um, may have been diverted. You may have come earlier. You may be wondering if you're getting back to where you came from. Um, we all volunteer our time, talent, and treasure to the institution that we love. Just a show of hands, for how many is this your first volunteer conference? Well, welcome. And we hope it will not be your last volunteer conference. Um, Mount Holyoke's mission is to educate young women to go out and contribute to the world, and the world's increase increasingly diverse and complex. Uh, but it takes our time. We hope you'll come will connect with students, will have the opportunity to talk to students at meals and hear from students during this week. We have an exciting day of sessions and the sessions are structured so a lot of them are all of us together and then we'll separate into various tracks depending upon whether you're a young alum or a not so young alum, a reunion planner or someone who's interested in raising money. And in a lot of cases, people in this room wear multiple hats in their class. Um, so attend the sessions that you think will benefit you and your class the most. There's plenty of time, as we've heard from our surveys, for classes to get together, especially those planning a reunion. So another show of hands before I end. Um, how many people are here and planning a reunion or attending a reunion in the next two years? Well, you guys have a lot of hard work to do. <laughs> so I'm turning it over to Melissa to start some more introductions for this morning's events. 
So um, I'd like to introduce some key leaders who are with us today who will be speaking this morning. But first, um, we'd like to thank the staff at the Alumni Association and the Advancement Offices for all their efforts in putting together this conference for the weekend. So thank you so much. So first, this morning, we're going to hear um, a welcome message from President Sonia Stevens via video. And then we're going to have uh, Maria Masadas from uh, the Alumni Association as the new uh, Alumni Association president will speak. After that, we will have Nancy Perez and um, Cassandra Jolly speak together. Um, followed by, um, in conclusion, we'll have John Western, who's the Vice President for Academic uh, Affairs and the Dean of Faculty. So that's our lineup for this morning. So without any further ado, we are going to put on a video message from President Stevens. I'm so pleased to welcome you back to campus, albeit virtually. As many of you know, I enjoy spending time with you at any occasion, and especially during this volunteer conference weekend. And I was very disappointed not to be on campus to spend time with you on this occasion. A family conflict prevents me from being in South Hadley. Um, and as you're watching this, I want you to know that um, I'm taking my first son to college to begin his own college career. So this conference is a moment to acknowledge all of the ways in which you express your loyalty and to and support of Mount Holyoke. And I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to you for your work on behalf of the college and its alumni association. As alumni, you bring really important perspectives and personal narratives to the work we do together to extend the reputation and reach of Mount Holyoke and to support our mission. It's through your stories and experiences that the value of a Mount Holyoke education and that the texture and opportunity of the experience here are brought to life. This conference is also an opportunity for us to share information with you and for you to share ideas with each other. It's a moment that marks our deep collaboration and our interdependence. So whether you work most closely with the Advancement Office, the Alumni Association, the Career Development Center, admissions, or other organizations on campus. We deeply appreciate your collaboration with us and the ways in which you demonstrate that model of collaboration for others in our community. I also want to thank John Weston for being there with you in my absence. I know that you'll enjoy spending time with him as much as I do. And I very much hope that I shall see some of you on inauguration weekend. This is a special moment for me, of course, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to continue to serve you and Mount Holyoke. It's also a new chapter in Mount Holyoke's history and a special opportunity to engage our community and prospective students in our vision and in the excitement we all share for the future of the college. Thank you again for spending this time with us and for all that you do in support of the college. I hope that you will all have an enjoyable and productive weekend and that if I don't see you uh, at the end of September, that I will see you in the coming weeks and months. Thank you once again for all that you do to support our work. Good morning. I want to add my welcome and thanks to all of you for joining us for the annual volunteer conference. Um, I am Maria Masaitis, and I am both humbled and honored to serve as the new president of the Alumni Association. Thank you. My husband bet I couldn't say this without crying. <laughs> okay, so whether you're returning to assist with reunion planning or advancement, it is really wonderful to have you back on campus. And for me, it's uh, especially wonderful to see so many familiar faces 
people who I have worked with through the years and from whom I have learned so much. Um, and for those of you who I have not yet had the pleasure to meet, I look forward to meeting each one of you this weekend and learning a little bit about you and hoping that we will be able to work together over the three years um, of my tenure as president. As volunteers, you represent the leadership of our alumni community, and you play a critical role. President Stevens mentioned volunteers help in a wide range of activities. We support advancement, we work in a variety of alumni association, volunteer work, we support the various centers on campus, the Career Development Center, athletics, um, the choral groups, a variety of places. And this weekend, as you're, if you, we've talked, we're going to give you an update on what's happening on campus. I'd like to start by sort of mentioning that, as you are aware, um, last November, the Alumni Association and the college entered into a historic new 10-year agreement. Um, yes. Uh, this agreement um, grew out of work of the commission that explored the relationship between the college and the alumni association. Um, as you can imagine, the structures that support alumni are varied and unique to the history of every institution. At Mount Holyoke, the Alumni Association was always an independent entity that supported the work of the college. I'm really thrilled about this agreement because it creates a structure for the enhanced coordination of efforts between the association and the college. And I am really excited that I will be part of the team that will lead the implementation. But I hope that each one of you will also play a key role in achieving our goals. Last year, we commissioned a benchmarking report on the best practices for alumni engagement. This report and the recommendations for the first steps will be shared um, both later on this month and in early October with the boards of both the college's board of trustees and the alumni trustees. And I expect that the discussions that we will have over this weekend will yield many useful suggestions to that effort. The strong connection between alumni and the college, what we all know to be that fanatical loyalty unique to Mount Holyoke, was part of Mary Lyon's original vision. As alumni leaders, all of us are custodians of that historical legacy that has ensured the survival of this institution for 181 years. Mary Lyon recognized that her school and its graduates would need to form strong bonds if both were to fulfill their goals. Both the Mary Lyon offered her students and teachers the opportunity to improve their status so that they could change the world for the better. And Mary Lyon students returned that loyalty. They stayed to teach at the seminary, they founded sister institutions, and those sister institutions and the college itself in turn hired Mount Holyoke graduates. Mount Holyoke backed these early graduates, helping them to find steady, well-paying jobs in respectable posts. The encouragement of the small community of women provided each other enabled their success. And in turn, their success sustained Mount Holyoke by justifying the provision of higher education to women. So we are trustees of those trailblazing women back in 1837. Mary Lyon challenged gender barriers to education and her graduates continue to be in innovators. You can look at them in the posters in Willits, all of these women across the decades who really were leaders in their professions. I know that countless glass ceilings were broken by many of you sitting 
in this room today. As much as we are justly proud of this amazing heritage, Mount Holyoke would not have survived without evolving and continually innovating. Mount Holyoke in 2018 is a different institution than the 1837 seminary. The commitment to women's education, to preparing leaders who will purposely engage in the world has remained unchanged. But our students now represent many cult countries and cultures, not just farm girls from the Pioneer Valley. The 673 graduates of the class of 2018 have brought the number of Alumni Association members to 38,178. Wow. I think Mary Lyon would have been exceptionally proud <laughs> to have that many daughters alive today. And about 3,000 live outside of the continental United States, and we expect that that number will continue to grow. And Mount Holyoke alums now live in 139 countries, including the United States. The current students and graduates represent a more diverse community than at any point in the college's history, and we should all be very proud of that accomplishment. Our community represents a diversity of race, culture, religion, and gender identity, and political persuasion. And let's not forget something that I'm amazed at, that our alums now span eight decades of experience. And last reunion, we had two individuals aged 97 who returned for their reunion. I'm going to sort of ask you to take up a challenge. Um, and I know that Mount Holyoke women um, love a challenge. And I think the challenge is that we need to forge new connections for the 21st century Mount Holyoke. I recognize that for many of us, or at least for some of us, this may take us outside of our comfort zone. And we're going to need to learn some new language. I will tell you that I attended a conference this winter, and in the registration, they asked me which pronoun I wanted to be referred to. And um, I remember smirking and saying, what the hell is that about? Um, and I got this look, or a series of looks, from my young staff that rolled their eyes at this elderly woman who was their boss. And they explained it to me. Um, and then it occurred to me, it took me back to 1970, when I decided I did not want it to be called Miss, I wanted to be called Ms. And then a couple of years later, the shock and horror of our families when I announced that I was not taking my spouse's name, but keeping my own name. And so, even though the sort of language may have changed, that through the years, we have all had to make adjustments. Our challenge is how to build and sustain a community a more, across a more diverse and global alumni network. It may not be possible for everyone to return to campus for reunion, not just because of distance, but because of a myriad of other reasons. And we ought to be able to use technology. I'm not good at this, but other people are. Um, uh, my 14-year-old grandson can explain it to me. Um, but there ought to be ways that we can link classmates and friends using technology. And perhaps we can plan a Google Hangout during reunion weekend to say hello to classmates who are not able to get to South Hadley, whether they can't get to South Hadley from Michigan or whether it's Hong Kong. Although class is still a strong connection, many alums 
have other equally strong affiliations, such as sports team, singing groups, and other extracurricular activities. Many alums are more interested in connecting with others in their professions rather than their class. And the association is exploring using Reunion 2 to host these different affinity groups. And this year, for the first time, we will be hosting the first group of athletes at Reunion. We need to remember why we want to support the college. We are not just preserving this campus so that we can return to Reunion or for conferences. I feel really strongly that we need to play it forward. Our commitment to Mount Holyoke must include a commitment to current students. The work of this institution is not yet complete. I really thought when I was here as a student, when we were debating the Equal Rights Amendment, um, that perhaps the day would come when a woman's college was no longer needed. And as the events of this last year have proven in the Me Too movement, um, that Mary Lyon's work is not yet done. Um, a recent report indicated that we have made almost no progress in the number of women serving on Fortune 500 boards. So, I think we need Mount Holyoke for at least another century and a half. I think rather than try to recreate the past, we need to understand what the current students need, and we need to work really hard to make sure that the college has the resources to prepare this generation of young women to be leaders. I don't mean this and in any way to be disrespectful of our individual times here. In fact, as those of you who know, history is my passion. So I really relish each one of your unique experiences at Mount Holyoke, right? The period that we were here is wonderful, um, and what we want to do and need to do is to, in fact, preserve all of those memories. But we cannot allow those memories to hinder, in many respects, the progress of the institution. Um, I passionately believe um, that we need to continue the fight for gender equity in this 21st century, just as Mary Lyons and her successors did in the 19th and 20th. And I take great pride, and I shout it from the rooftops, that we were the first institution that provided higher education for women in the world. So it is a very appropriate that we should be reaching out to support women across the world. So OK. We need to get creative about how we support alums' connection with each other and with the college. How can we uh, collect, connect alumni with current students and recent graduates? How can we support new graduates as they enter graduate school or the job market? How can we support current faculty? How can we design programs to support alums through the various life stages that they will face? And how do we welcome alums to new cities or countries when they move? And we need to start with each one of us. For too many years, separate volunteer conferences were held for advancement and reunion volunteers. And although many of you will be attending separate tracks, you are part of one leadership team. You are your class's ambassadors, and I hope that we will model that spirit of openness and inclusion, that your outreach and fundraising efforts will be collaborative and integrated. For it is only when alums feel valued and included that they will provide the financial support 
that will support the institution that supported each one of us. And I also want to sort of offer a challenge asking you that um, to sort of think about your own class leadership and to ask whether that class leadership is as reflective of the diversity of your own class. And if it's not, let's see what we can do in this next round to increase that diversity. One of the unanticipated bonuses of being a volunteer is getting to meet and work with so many incredible graduates. I have friends who span decades, both before and after my 1973 graduation. I love hearing stories of your experiences, both when you're on campus and in your lives and careers. Getting to know each one of you has truly been a gift. Um, and what I'd like to do is to ask you to do me one favor. So before I close, to take a couple of questions, I want to ask you to do two things over the weekend. I want you to think of one aha moment when you were a student here, and one example of when a Mount Holyoke alum made a big difference in your post-college life. And I am hoping that over this weekend, you will grab me and share those stories with you. And I will share with you back my aha moment, um, and the first time a Mount Holyoke graduate helped me, and she truly launched my career. So thank you very much, and let me see if there are any questions. Oh, my friend Jane, I'm in big trouble now. <laughs> And that's to travel with Mount Holyoke and to consider joining us along with Maria and others in Jaipur, India in January. The alumni symposiums in Europe and Asia are extremely wonderful opportunities to meet alums who are not in your class, who may not reunion the same year you do. And you know, when we talk about aha moments, I have, I'm traveling with people that I met on those alumni symposiums years ago. So you know, that, that's it. The other thing I forgot to recognize is we have people from near and far at this conference. We have people here who live in South Hadley. We have people who came from California and if everyone showed up, we have three individuals who came from the UK uh, to come to this conference. So, you know, we continue to welcome everyone. Questions? Well, you're letting me off easy. Is this because this is my first presentation as president? <laughs> Sure. Um, that it's, it's fair to say that the sort of the new agreement is a 10-year agreement, and this goes back to the... I'm actually reading up on the history of the association. Um, the association had, um, from its founding as the Memorandum Society, been the vehicle that did fundraising um, for alumni. And in fact, uh, there's a wonderful history that I'm just getting... Just getting to the part of the alumni raising the money to build Brigham, Rocky, the Rockies, all of the dorms. And there was a very close, uh, you know, that the, the Alumni Association and the College's Board of Trustees, the College's Board of Trustees would say, here's our next group of things that we need to do. And then the alumni would go out and raise money amongst themselves. Oftentimes, that money, <clears throat> excuse me, was a matching grant for external funds that literally built the entire campus uh, Mary Woolley Hall, I mean, you can name the dorms, they were all literally built um, with alumni sort of funding. And then at one point, um, the, the sort of, uh, as all schools created um, a more professionally based advancement operation, um, the Alumni Association gave that sort of function 
still run by and supported, obviously, by annual fund and other um, campaign volunteers. But the way in which the association was funded was by utilizing some of the contributions to pay for the cost of the alumni association. When that happened, which was around the time, actually, that I was here, only I didn't understand any of this stuff was happening, um, uh, that there has been an agreement where the college provides uh, the basic support for the costs of the association. And the association is responsible for certain functions, reunion being one of the sort of major functions, the quarterly and a whole bunch of other communication to alumni. Um, and those agreements over time were for three-year stretches, um, which meant that we were no sooner negotiating one and starting the second one. Um, and um, as you all know, um, that we um, went through, in the history of the college and the association, there have been times um, when the two organizations were not perfectly aligned. Um, All right, do I, do I get points for thinking? I've been thinking about this. Um, at, one of them happened, obviously, at the time when Mary Woolley was asked to step down as president of the college, which for me is a very painful part of our history, and Francis Perkins never then set foot on this campus again, which is really a tragedy, because she's my hero. However, um, we, 15 years ago, entered another one of those difficult periods. Um, and I think that uh, credit needs to go to Marsha, my predecessor, and everyone who was on the board, both of the college's board and the Alumni Association. And I think many of you in this room have worked really tirelessly um, to heal what I have referred to as the troubles. It's like a family having a fight, right? You know, it's like Thanksgiving dinner um, with the, the, you know, the cousin that you don't like. Um, so uh, that agreement um, represents a commitment for 10 years of funding. Um, the staff of the association have now moved on to become staff of the college. We are still an independent entity, um, but that means that our staff actually have access to a whole bunch of other um, educational benefits that the association itself could not replicate. But I think the most important part of the agreement is the kind of joint planning, um, the sort of joint calendaring. I mean, we're working on so many activities so that we're not going to have um, what some of you experienced several years ago, where um, the Advancement um, Office and the Alumni Association both held an event and the same day at the same hotel, right? So people showed up, oh, I'm here for the Mount Holyoke event, and ended up at two very different events, right? Um, and so that was, and I remember hearing from alums saying, was that the most, that, that, that does, does not befit a Mount Holyoke graduate. So we are now working more closely. And just another example, our two strategic planning cycles are not aligned, right? So we have two conflicting periods of our strategic plan. All of that is now going to be sort of more seamless, um, at the same time respecting the independent voice of the association. The quarterly will still be our communication device. Um, but I think what we're talking about is that the association's goal, our mission, is to connect alums with each other so that we can support each other and our connection to the college. And so we are now going to really focus on the planning for alumni engagement so that we can be successful across these 38,178 and climbing, okay? Um, and that we can utilize the resources of the college more effectively towards engagement of alumni um, and therefore, that we will be more successful in raising the funds needed to support this institution, support this beautiful campus, um, and create all of the new things, like the makerspace, um, that um, our young students today absolutely need 
if they are going to gain the skills to be successful in the world. Did that answer your question? Um, and we, we make copies of the agreement available. It's, I think it's on a, a website. Um, but I, I think it's really, it's a pleasure to be able to say that the troubles are behind us. Another question? This is great. We're running early. Good. Okay. So um, remember those two questions. I am looking forward to chronicling all of these. Oh, one more question. Yes. Talking about going, going forward, what was the Alumni Association doing before this agreement? We were operating under a prior agreement, um, so it wasn't like we didn't have an agreement, but there wasn't this synergy of goals, right? Um, uh, and I think that, I think it's fair to say that there was some continued tension around function. So we have now created a structure where if an issue comes up, which we are hoping it won't, that there's ways of resolving who's doing what, who's primarily responsible for one function versus another. And I think a, a renewed acknowledgement of the critical role that the Alumni Association plays in the engagement of alumni and our role in doing that. Right, it helps all of that. And, and we're really sort of, one of the things that we're kind of, think, that I'm thinking about um, is um, perhaps, and, and several people have offered suggestions of things they've done in a sort of other uh, areas of their life, of trying to sort of formalize a connection between recent graduates. So if you're going to graduate school, um, you're, let's say you're going to you know, law school at Northeastern University, we have recent graduates um, of Northeastern law who are Mount Holyoke graduates. And doesn't it make sense to hook up recent graduates of these institutions with Mount Holyoke graduates who are at those institutions? Because frankly, who you take evidence with may make a big difference, right? So someone saying, oh, don't take that person for evidence, take this person for evidence. Or someone who can sort of make that call, that that are the two weeks before that first exam period where you're like out of your mind because you think you're going to flunk out of law school and say, no, you're not, okay? And those connections, and I think similar connections with respect to people who are working for large companies. Um, I obviously work in Boston, and we have the pharmaceutical companies. Well, I am sure that there, I know that there are Mount Holyoke senior people at these institutions, and it would be really helpful for them to be connected, to know, oh, by the way, your company just hired three recent bio grads who are now working for Biogen, and why don't you go stop by their cube and say hello, right? I think that those connections are connections that we can make, that we should make, that reinforce the value. Why do you come here? I came here because there were going to be a lot of other women who were going to support me and who have supported me throughout my entire life. And so we need to play that forward and make sure that those connections exist in addition to the link connection. We need to think about how many ways can we continue to provide support to each other. And that's what I'm talking about. Faculty, this alumni can bring so much into the classrooms here and into the educational scene. And I've been asked by other institutions to come speak and do all sorts of things, but not Mount Holyoke. And so, you know, who's doing that part? You, the Alumni Association? Guess or what? The That's on the list. <laughs> That's on the to-do list. And it's really looking at, I mean, what, what happens now is that individual faculty members who know students or who, know, who sort of reach out to their former students and ask them to come back and lecture in a class. 
That, we, did, we don't have the tool. So that's just on a very ad hoc basis. It's probably on someone's Excel spreadsheet, okay? Um, what we are hoping to do is to take all of that information and really create a more robust database um, so that if a faculty member says, gee, I would like to identify someone who can do X, Y, and Z, that we will be able to better find a perfect match for that faculty member, which then just reinforces everyone's connection to the college and the current students. Um, so really the challenge is, what are the multiple ways that we can connect? And we can connect someone from outside of the United States. I mean, you can really sort of do a Zoom. The Alumni Association now holds meetings, or at least one meeting a year, and many of our subcommittees do, really visually. Um, it means no one has to sort of, you know, get on a plane and um, travel long distances. And because you can see them, it becomes this very effective vehicle. And so there are ways in which, in a classroom, uh, modern classrooms have all of this equipment, where you can actually then sit in your living room or sit in your office at work and be part of a classroom discussion. Um, and I think for students, having all of our work experience or life experience, doesn't just have to be work, um, is going to really be a value add to them um, and means that when they start working, um, they're going to be in a better circumstance. Let me just share one experience. Um, my daughter, Sophia, um, who I hope will bring me back for my 80th reunion. Sophia, wherever you are, uh, I'm planning on your bringing me back, <laughs> okay, um, so that I can be here at age 97, um, hopefully not drooling on myself. Um, but um, that one of the things that happened was Sophia was one of the first students to be a Weissman Center Fellow. And she went to work for our um, state representative, who just recently stepped down as the Massachusetts State, state um, Senate President. Um, and after her summer experience, I got a call from S Senator Chandler. And she said to me, I have never allowed an intern to do what I let your daughter do. And I reminded Harriet that, well, Harriet's a graduate of that other school, Wellesley. Uh, um, and I said, well, Harriet, I said, it's the training that she got at the Weissman Center, right? So she arrived in an internship in a way that our state senator allowed her to do things that a young staff person would not be able to do. So we need to make sure that our current students get that extra value add so that they can be the best that they can be. Okay. I am now done, and I look forward to talking with you. Thank you. Good morning. Everybody have enough coffee? Yes? We're going to come back together into one conversation. Good morning. My name is Cassandra Jolly. I'm called Vice President for Advancement. People sometimes ask what advancement is. I say one of two things. Vision without resources is hallucination. So I make sure that Mount Holyoke is not hallucinating and that we have the resources to ensure that we can fulfill our mission. The second thing I often say is you can call me anything you want, just don't call me Vice President of Collections and we'll be fine. I'm um, thrilled to, to introduce myself to you, and I've had the pleasure of meeting so many um, of the people in this room, but not everyone. So I want to share with you a little bit about my, my background, um, and then Nancy will um, come up, and then we have some um, other things that we'd like to talk with you about. So I arrived at Mount Holyoke in uh, March of 2016. Uh, some days seem longer than others, but most of the days are not as, as long as I, I feel today. Um, the, uh, I came directly from Spelman College. Spelman College is a historically black college for women in Atlanta, Georgia, if you don't know. Um, and it was led at that moment by Beverly Daniel Tatum, um, who is a wonderful Mount Holyoke um, faculty member, 
former dean of the college, acting president, and I'm really proud to say a mentor and friend to me. She recruited me to Spelman um, from the vice presidency at Roger Williams University in Rhode Island. Um, and prior to that, I worked at my own alma mater, which at the time was called Simmons College. Um, Simmons has changed its name to Simmons University. Um, and uh, I am a graduate of that institution. I also went to an all-girls high school. So I am, uh, my alignment with Mount Holyoke around mission, cause, and purpose um, is deep and uh, runs very deep. Um, when I'm not vice being vice president for advancement at Mount Holyoke, I am mother to Olivia, who is 14 and um, a student at the South Hadley High School. Um, that's about her being in high school, not the high school that she's at. Um, and, uh, and Clara, who is 12, um, and they are, um, I often, they say, Mom, do we have to go to Mount Holyoke? And I said, you don't have to go to Mount Holyoke. Do we have to go to Simmons? I said, no, you have to go to Simmons. Um, you can go anywhere you want, but my checks are going to a women's college. Good morning. Um, I'm Nancy Perez. I am a graduate of the class of 76. I know Joni's here. I think we may be the only one from um, the class of 76 here today. Um, but I am uh, the executive director of the Alumni Association, arrived in this role um, as an interim uh, two months before um, Cassandra arrived here at Mount Holyoke and um, came for um, a year, and I'm here, um, and very thrilled to be here. But um, I had a long career at IBM, and had retired from IBM, and was hanging out with my friends, Joni one of them, and um, ran into Marianne, and a lot happened after that. <laughs> a lot of coincidences kind of built on each other. But anyway, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here today. And I know some of you, this is, um, I was thinking, this is the, our, my first year here, it was our reunion. So that's six, seven, eight. This is our, my fourth reunion cycle that I will have been through. Um, the most, the thing I remember most from the first year I was here is that we had to do reunion again. You know, you come to reunion and you're used to leaving. And it was, um, we were reunion one. We were also chairing reunion. And so reunion was over, and you know the high you get from reunion. I was like, then the staff was like, okay, well, we're doing it again next week. <laughs> I was like, how do you do that? But anyway, so um, it's, it's a pleasure to um, meet you all. Some of you I know, some of you I don't, and I look forward to spending time with you all um, this weekend. Cassandra and I are going to be talking to you about a topic around um, values very quickly. But if you don't mind, I had two, three notes I made to myself, um, Maria, when you were talking about the agreement. So I just wanted to make, um, <laughs> I just wanted to make three quick points. One of the big differences about the agreement is Cassandra, myself, Shannon Gurek, who's the Vice President of Finance and Administration, and Chuck Green, who's the new Vice President of Communications, meet monthly without fail and talk about all of the work we're doing together. That's built into the agreement. There are structures for, my perception is just like the family. People get mad at each other and they don't talk and they're never gonna talk again. In this agreement, there are specific structures for disagreement. And how do we address areas where there may be issues? And if we can't come to agreement, and there hasn't been an example of that yet, there's, there are procedures above that that then go to Maria and Sonia or, and the Board of Trustees if necessary. So there is, there is built into this a discussion on a regular basis around key decisions, key programs, key um, key budget issues that happen between us because we know the work, we know the people, et cetera. So that's one big difference. The other big difference, and one of the reasons we could make an agreement for 10 years, is we are now participating in the college's budget cycle on an annual basis. In the past, there was a specific dollar amount built into the agreement for that period of time. The Alumni Association submitted our budget. It was considered along with the rest of the college's budget. It was down this year. It's been down for the last two years. 
But we understand that, we understand why, and we've been able to work within that. But for, for now, we are, and during the t period of this agreement, we are working on an annual basis within the college's budget, and we never did that before. And so um, the college is still one of our primary funders, but we have a lot more accountability and um, transparency around how we're spending the money. And, and this team and all of you and John and, and Sonia and those at the college have an opportunity to work with us on prioritizing some of that work. So I just made a couple of notes. I think those are the two big pieces, um, and so all of the work you're going to be hearing about this weekend and all of the exciting things in our future, we are all working on together, and I have the privilege as part of this to participate and be a member of the officers group, so I'm at the table now every week with the officers and feet held to the fire along with everyone else, but also getting to participate and, and, and share, and the alumni experience is all part of that. So. I'm sorry to take those couple of minutes, but I think it helps put a little bit of color around that. So, on to the discussion. Um, Maria touched on this. We, Cassandra and I wanted to spend a few minutes this morning with you around a topic that is very important, and it's, it's restating our commitment to values. Um, as alumni, you all are key alumni volunteers, and we felt it was very important that we take a pause before we kick off the next um, couple of days and talk about this. You are going to have the real privilege of meeting Kijua Sanders McMurtry, our new and first ever um, Chief Diversity Officer and Vice President, later on um, this morning. And Kijua worked with us a bit as well on this. And what we really wanted to do was, as Sonia articulated so well, there is a deep collaboration between the college and the alumni. And there's a huge interdependence. And we wanted to take a minute and spend a few moments to level set on the very important values that you, as our alumni leaders, can help us spread through the alumni community as we work with each other and as we work with students. So um, I don't usually read, but I'm going to read a short piece to you. And then Cassandra's going to go through some bulleted values that we've worked with um, Kijua in articulating. So one of the key values around, at Mount Holyoke is our commitment to diversity in all of its forms. We don't, and we don't just talk about diversity. We are living diversity. We are educating our students and our faculty and our staff around all levels of educating students for the highest level of academic excellence. In doing so, we are committed to an inclusive approach that supports, educates, and nurtures the identity differences of everyone in our community. We recognize that diversity enhances our lives, that it helps us understand more fully the socio-political world in which we live, and prepares us to seek global solutions and further Mount Holyoke's long-standing commitment to social justice. Because we value inclusiveness, Mount Holyoke has become a national leader in creating and sustaining diversity, and as key members of our extended community, it's more and more important that as that our alumni volunteers also embrace these principles, both while on campus and while out in events or a meeting with students, et cetera. So in, in, with that as background, we talked and worked through a set of principles and guiding, kind of to guide us in our discussions. Um, and so Cassandra's going to go through those values there. They're on the screen on either end, the small to read, but you also have a handout with them as well. And so I'll turn it over to you. I'm not going to read them because you can. And I had um, a recent birthday, which, which means I can't see those. I don't know if you can. Um, but what I want to say is, um, in this moment, if you would take a moment or throughout the weekend to read these commitments, let us know if you think we've missed anything. Give us your feedback. 
if you would like to. And the most important thing that I want to say is if you feel or observe that any of these values are not being expressed by any member of the community, that you come forward and that you talk with us about that. We have had some moments, uh, particularly in the past year, where we have been working with alumni where some of these values have not been held uh, up in the interactions. And it's really important that you all um, hold each other accountable um, and or utilize the resources that are on campus um, to allow us to help in those situations. So the charge to you is to read through this, take a look at these principles, let us know if anything's missing, give us feedback, um, and also to use us as a resource as you are uh, conducting your work on behalf of Mount Holyoke. And part of the reason I'm not gonna read through them is I see that John Western uh, is here out of the corner of my eye, and he is the real star of this show. So um, I, Nancy and I will take a que questions or comments um, before we turn the program over to John. Yes. Yeah. Disseminated to all uh, alumni. Yeah, so what we thought we would do this weekend is get your feedback, um, and so I welcome any thoughts, and then we can, we can in many ways, um, make it available to all alumni on the website and social media, et cetera, but it would be great to get your thoughts this weekend, as, as Cassandra asked, and then we'll do that. I think that's really very important. I, I, I see in this an absence of commitment to science and scientific knowledge. Okay. And the, dis, and the disbursement, the, the discussion of scientific knowledge. Facts. Yes. Facts. Okay. Facts. Yeah. Good. Facts. We'll add. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Hi, Karen. Uh, Cassandra, you referred to circumstances that some of these were not followed. Could you share generally what would be an example of one of those things? Um, so uh, let me think about how I want to fra frame it. Um, not, not valuing um, identity, certain identities on campus. I had a personal experience uh, myself where an alumna um, was disparaging to me about a certain characteristic um, in my, in, 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 of my own um, I'm not being very articulate about that. Um, and so it, it, can, it can run the gamut. I don't worry about me so much, right? I'm a grown up. I've got, I, I, I know how to handle myself. I worry more um, about my team and I worry about our students. And we want everybody to feel validated, valued in the myriad of identities. Um, and we want everybody to be able to bring their authentic self to the work and to their studies at Mount Holyoke. That I would add to that is I think to Cassandra's point, what, what has happened on a few occasions is, um, and it tends to happen over reunion weekend, but I have also observed it at club events. Um, sometimes a student will be um, will be inadvertently the, the focus of a comment, et cetera, and our staff, you know, Janet's a perfect example, will, will hurt for that person and want to be able to know how to to um, address it, right, in an appropriate way. And so we're spending a lot of time with our staff and our teams around that. But the more, the more we can do to educate ourselves, um, I even know, I, if I remember, and I'm not gonna pinpoint the class, but I was at dinner with a class um, this, this past reunion where some of the classmates observed that behavior on, some of the, on the part of some of their their classmates, and also were uncomfortable. So I think we're all kind of experiencing it to a bit of a degree, and we noticed it more this reunion and spring than other times, and that's why we thought, you know, let's take a pause. Um, and Sonia asked us to do the same. Last question? Uh, I'm from California. We could use a little more love. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understand the audience for this is the uh, alumni, alumni volunteer. volunteer. Yes. Not necessarily all alumni. Well, I and think the college must have its own statement of values. Is there is so there the a college way to set it in that context? Yes, um, and th as I said, this is a first step to pilot this and test this with you all this weekend. Um, you all are going to be spending time with Kijua. Um, we'd like her, uh, we're working now that she is here, we can work together more intentionally around that. But as leaders and as people who will bring, be bringing your classes back and talking to classes, we thought this was a trusted group to start this work with. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there was, I think, one. One more. One more. I'm from the Boston area, and there's been a lot of news recently about Harvard having to um, undo the charters of single-sex organizations. Is there any threat to Mount Holyoke remaining a single-sex institution? I know. I appreciate That's kind of a loaded question, yeah, John. <laughs> That's a perfect segue. From our charter perspective, I'm not aware of any threat. No. no. Um, so, Alice, you have the last word on this. Make it a good one. Make it a good one, Alice. Are we introducing John? Oh, so I have the great pleasure <laughs> of introducing uh, John Western. John is the Dean of Faculty here at Mount Holyoke um, and is um, going to be able to spend some time with you giving an update John, when Sonia started with the, the uh, video, and thank you. So I thank you as well for spending time with us. She thanked you as well for um, filling in as she's taking um, her son to school. So welcome and thank you. Well, good morning. Um, it is great to see this place is packed. This is awesome. Um, standing room only. Um, I will say a couple of weeks ago we had... Uh, our, our fall advising retreat for the faculty uh, returning, and um, it was the same size. Uh, it was standing room only. Uh, the faculty are super, super excited to be welcoming the class of uh, 2022 to campus. Um, we had standing room only here for, for our faculty, um, uh, getting information about how to, uh, to talk to our students and to, uh, to engage with them on the, as they begin their journey through the through their Mount Holyoke education. So uh, it's great to see this room packed, uh, both in that context and in this context. Um, and thank you, Nancy and Cassandra, for organizing this event and, and for inviting me to, to spend some time this morning with you. Um, I would like to start by just saying that um, uh, the work that we do at Mount Holyoke um, is special. The work that our faculty and staff do every single day to support the student population that, that is here. Um, is an incredible, uh, it's an incredible amount of work and commitment and passion um, and the professionalism, the, the, uh, the engagement with the students, it is, it is a really special place. Um, our students are super excited to be here uh, and watching them from that first advising which moment, um, last week I had my first, uh, my, my, my advising uh, session with my first year students seeing them come to campus nervous, excited, confident, completely over their heads, um, all simultaneously. And then thinking, you know, back to May when, when my students uh, and our students graduated and watching the confidence, the maturity, the judgment, the poise, the everything, and thinking about that journey. You all remember it. But that journey is a four-year time window. It's short, it is powerful, it is impactful. And our faculty and staff are committed to that every single day, and every single iterative moment of a student's career here is impacted by the commitment of the faculty and staff. We can't do that work without the, the incredible generosity of your time, your energy, your financial resources. So I just want to start by saying thank you. Um, what we do here collectively is, is really amazing. And the women who, who graduate from Mount Holyoke and go on into the world uh, do incredibly amazing things. And I want to thank you all for that. Um, so what I'd like to do is <clears throat> talk a little bit about what a liberal arts education is in the 21st century and where we are with, uh, with uh, uh, our curriculum 
and how we are preparing our students for a world that is incredibly dynamic, incredibly uh, changing, um, and, and we're developing a curriculum that is forward-looking to be able to address some of the most complex challenges that the world has ever seen. So how are we doing that? Well, first of all, we've welcomed a class of 626 students to Mount Holyoke this fall. That is a record, and we are super excited about that. It suggests that uh, we are doing something right, that uh, our students, uh, at the, they uh, applied to Mount Holyoke and accepted their admissions to Mount Holyoke, uh, saw something in, in what we did. Um, we have hired over the course of the last um, five years and over the course of the next two years, roughly half of our faculty will be new to this institution. Uh, that is a major generational change for the institution. Um, but what it means is it gives us an opportunity to, to think about the curriculum, reimagine it, rework it, uh, to move it forward looking. So when we hire, uh, this year we will, be, uh, we will be issuing some allocations for, uh, for searches for next year. Those faculty will arrive on campus in the year 2020 in their first year of, of, um, in their first year of, uh, uh, of uh, an assistant professorship. They will probably run a 40-year career, which means they will be here at this institution through 2060. In 2060, they will have a student who will arrive uh, in that first-year class or their second-year class, and that student will then come back for her 80th or their 80th, their 80th reunion in the year 2140. So the legacy of our decisions this fall are pretty significant. So how are we preparing our students for the world that is going to change in ways that we can't imagine? And I think back um, last, uh, last spring, I met with a class of 1968 um, in a group, um, and they had told me, they met with a class of 2018, 50-year window, and they had told me that when they were students here in the class, in, in, in their graduating year, they had met with the class of 1918. Um, and it's just, I, I, I situate that to think about what it is, how the world has changed since 1918 and 1968. The education that we're, we're providing for our students is not just so that they can go out and get a job after they graduate from Mount Hill. It's to prepare them for a world that is going to change in ways that we can't imagine. The pace of scientific discovery and technological innovation, if it is on par in the 21st century as, this, as it has been over the last, 20, the last two centuries with artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, nanotechnologies, we can't even imagine what the jobs are that our students are going to be thinking about in 2060, in, 21, in 2060, when our faculty member who we hire this year is going to be retiring. What is that faculty member going to be preparing for that student uh, in terms of the curriculum? So it's not just an instrumental education giving our students the skills to go out and get that first job. It's giving our students a set of knowledge and skills by which they can go out and adapt to a world that is going to be moving at incredible speed. But it's not just adapting to the speed of change, it's also to understand what are the enduring conditions of the human experience. And so when we think holistically about the liberal arts education, and the case that I want to make is not that liberal arts are relevant. That seems to me to be a, a bit of a defensive. Liberal arts are an imperative. We have to have a liberal arts education. We can't just defend them and say, oh, on the, uh, by the way, it's relevant to your career. It is imperative for society <clears throat> because there are fast-moving changes. And in our science labs, uh, we are seeing those. In our computer science labs, in our biology labs, our chemistry labs, our neuroscience labs, across the STEM fields, we are seeing incredible technological innovation and scientific discovery in medicine, <clears throat> in all kinds of areas. And our faculty are positioning our students incredibly well for the world that is going to be moving at breakneck speed with respect to those fields. 
But we also want those students and all of our students to be understanding that the world has certain continuities. And there is nothing stronger in helping us understand that, the concepts of respect and empathy, than to engage our students in the humanities, in a deeply rooted conception of what it means to be a human being on this planet with, with an incredibly diverse and an incredibly um, uh, engaged community of globalization. So as I teach in my courses in international human rights, I have a whole set of social science literatures, but for me to, to, to teach concepts of empathy, I use literature because there's nothing deeper and more grounding than the narratives of, of, of authors who can convey in stories. So when we think about our students and preparing for the world that's changing, we want them to understand, too, how deeply important it is that things change and seem to be moving in ways that are more complex than ever, but history tells us that the world has always been complex. But it isn't more complex, it's just differently complex. And so understanding the enduring human conditions is really critical. And we can convey that through our educational experiences in the creative and performing arts and the humanities. And that's critical. Uh, and the social sciences, the new techniques and methodologies that we have, the new data that we can collect is at unprecedented levels. Our ability to understand patterns of social interaction, cultural, economic, and political interaction are more sophisticated and more uh, in enlightening than we've ever had before. So our ability to understand the complexities of problems is, um, is different today than it has been in the past. In my research, I track mass atrocity violence. We can, in real time, because individuals have cell phones, we can actually identify patterns of violence, patterns of refugee movement, patterns of migration and displacement in ways that we've never had before, which allows us to get out in front and, pre and, and, and deploy humanitarian relief in corridors that we would anticipate through our GIS mapping and labs. All of that evidence is available to us in the social sciences, and it's the integration of social sciences, science, and the humanities that constitutes the liberal arts, and that's the case that we have to present to our students so that as they go out into the world, they're prepared for the complexities of the world around them. As I think about the challenges of the 21st century, so I am the Dean of Faculty and the Vice President for Academic Affairs at Mount Holyoke, uh, I am also a Professor of International Relations. And in my role as a Professor of International Relations, and I teach human rights and international security, I look at the challenges and, 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 and problems of the 21st century. I look at climate change, demographic stress, resource scarcity, environmental degradation, inequality, uh, social inequality, gender-based inequality, racial and ethnic and national origin inequality, cultural and economic inequality. Those problems exist. There are significant challenges. We also have challenges associated with the threat to the public sphere, democratic institutions and civil discourse. That is a fact. We're here in 20, here we are in, in, in 2018 trying to defend the concept of a fact. Um, what is scientific reasoning? Those are challenges of the 21st century that are different uh, in many ways. And the challenges are complex in that they do not, they're not bounded by traditional academic disciplines. This weekend, we were experiencing, uh, in the mid-Atlantic states, Hurricane Florence. A year ago, we had Hurricane Maria. Um, those are climate events. Let's be clear. Climate change is happening. Human beings are contributing significantly to climate uh, change. That's not in dispute. It shouldn't be in dispute. I'm sorry. It should not be in dispute. Scientific evidence. Scientific reasoning, scientific evidence, is overwhelmingly inclusive. A year ago, we had Hurricane Maria that dis disrupted uh, uh, the island of Puerto Rico and other Caribbean islands. That climate event led to the displacement of Puerto Rican populations who moved here to our neighboring community of Holyoke. 
which put enormous stress on the city of Holyoke, its educational system, its social services system. Um, it wasn't just a climate event that students who are aware of oceanographic or atmospheric science can identify. This is a profound social and demographic and economic and political disruption as a result of, uh, of that event. So addressing and getting a handle on climate change is not simply a scientific project. It is a project that is in, it is a project that requires us to fully understand uh, the integration of social, economic, cultural, uh, political uh, elements that are contributing, that are, that are intersecting with scientific um, bases of, of our understanding of the world. Our ability to control and mitigate the impacts of climate change will not come from our science labs, our, our, our environmental studies students, it will come from the combination of our students working collaboratively across disciplines. So in order to prepare our students for that kind of multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary uh, engagement with that particular issue requires us not just to have a whole set of siloed disciplinary departments in academic fields and then tell the students, you take this class, take this class, take this class, take this class, and you figure out how they're connected. It is, requires us as a, as a community of scholars and teachers and learners to work collaboratively in the formation of our curriculum so that our faculty know who's teaching where, what, who, who, who is teaching what other courses, and engage in collaborative kinds of teaching where we have more linked courses, more co-taught courses, more thematic courses. And we're engaged in a series of conversations on campus to fundamentally overhaul the curriculum that allows us to do much, much more integrated uh, teaching and learning. <clears throat> that is an ongoing process. We have a new model called linked courses that we're using where faculty from different disciplines are teaching uh, on the same theme but from profoundly different disciplinary approaches. So the questions that they ask of the same theme are different. The liberal arts is a space where we can do that. A liberal arts education is, is and liberal arts colleges is a, is a place where we can do that. And at Mount Holyoke, we pride ourselves on the fact that we're building an intellectual collaborative community to be able to prepare our students for the world that are going to have to confront those kinds of multidisciplinary uh, challenges. And that's not just in climate change. That's across the range of... of um, of issues with economic distress or economic uh, injustice or um, ways in which we can see our students uh, engaging in, in, in change as they would like to see um, uh, in the world. So <clears throat> how are we doing that? Again, with, uh, with, our, with our new faculty, we're building a curriculum that is looking forward, not looking backwards. So um, the curriculum is innovative. Um, it is it is fundamentally consistent and, and true to our core principles of a liberal arts education. We're building on the humanities, social sciences, and, and, and creative and performing arts uh, and sciences, but we are also trying to be creative about what it is that the students are going to be, what the students are going to need to be able to confront the world that they're, that they're moving forward on. We have hired a remarkably talented, diverse group of faculty over the last five years. We're going to continue to do that over the next couple of years uh, to revitalize uh, the institution and its curriculum and move it forward. Um, we have a number of initiatives that are embedded in that. Um, uh, as you know, this institution over the last 20 years has become a profoundly global institution. Almost 30% of our students come from outside of the United States. 25% uh, of our students are domestic students of color. Uh, this is an incredibly rich environment to teach and to learn. Our students are navigating across difference all of the time. They are challenging themselves. They're challenging each other. Uh, they are challenging the faculty, and occasionally they challenge the administration. Great. This is great. But the point is, is um, they are engaged in a community of learning that is complex, and they are learning different perspectives on the world every single day. 
And our, our curriculum is designed to embrace and empower that so that we understand that there isn't a single kind of trajectory or, or, or way of thinking about a problem. There are multiple ways of engaging uh, and asking questions of the world, and we want to see those reflected in the, in the, in the discovery process, in the education process. <clears throat> and that is a process that helps our students learn to be, uh, hear their voice, to see their voice, but also to understand the concept of, of difference and to respect difference and to engage across difference. And we believe strongly that that empowers them to be much more successful in a world that we know is going to become increasingly more different uh, as, 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 as they move through their lives. And as you all have experienced, I'm sure. So um, we are engaged in, in new curricular innovations. Um, I can cite a few of these just to give you an example of the ways in which we're thinking about preparing our students for the future. Uh, we received a major grant from the Sherman Fairchild Foundation a year ago for what we're calling our medial project, and I can't remember acronym, I'm sorry. It is essentially an arts and technology innovation. Uh, we have hired um, uh, a couple of faculty members to integrate technology into the arts. Uh, the Sherman Fairchild grant allowed us to invest in, uh, in the first year of the grant, allowed us to invest in uh, uh, redesigning a sound uh, design studio and a, a sound production studio over in Pratt. That was the first uh, investment. We hired a new faculty member, Thomas Chufo, who has done amazing work engaging with students on sound design and sound production in music, music composition. Uh, he is involved in our entrepreneurship organization and society program as we think about students who are, who are interested in, in sound uh, and music composition, what kinds of career aspirations might they have and they be the, they're interested in. Uh, our entrepreneurship program allows them uh, a set of skills to think about how they can take that knowledge and, and uh, the knowledge of, uh, of, of composition theory and sound design and production and actually go out and engage in the world in, um, in their own kind of uh, professional opportunities. Um, um, we have hired, the second phase of the Sherman Fairchild grant was to support uh, our maker and innovation lab. We've also had uh, very generous um, gifts from, from alums to help us. Prospect Hall is under construction right now. Um, this was a concept that started uh, a, a couple of years ago, about five years ago. We had, <clears throat> in our computer science department, Professor Audrey St. John developed a new course called iDesign. It started in a single classroom, and the iDesign course was to take students who were kind of interested in technology but had never really seen it, kind of interested in computer science, and to bring them together and to give them some opportunity to work with some, some basic conceptions of, of early kind of initial engineering and some, uh, <clears throat> some uh, development of some new technologies, and to give students some exposure to that. From that course, we dedicated a space in the art building, Art 211 is the room, as an interim maker space. And that space had a laser cutter and, and 3D printers and a whole series of computers for computer-aided design and things like that. And that was a space that we saw an enormous amount of student and faculty interest in. I took my human rights class into that space um, my students were very interested in drones and drone technologies and the use of unmanned uh, um, technologies in the application of force. So I had been assigning a whole series of essays in the makers, in, in, in <clears throat> on drones in my human rights class. But I asked my students, what do you know about the technology? And they didn't know much. So I took my students over, or I went over to, to, uh, to meet with Shawnee Menzi, who is a uh, graduate of the class of 2015, who was uh, an Aposi scholar, yes. <clears throat> and Shawnee sat down with me, and we brought in Nick Baker, who was from our uh, research, research instructional technology, or research instructional support team from our LITS. This is a 21st century reference librarian, by the way. And Nick and Shawnee and I prototyped a drone. 
Now, it was a drone rover. Risk management didn't let us do a flying drone. Restrictions. So it was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a drone rover. We prototyped it. Uh, we used the laser cutter to, to fabricate the, 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 the chassis and the body and the wheels. We put some motor controllers on there. We put some Arduinos, which are little microprocessors, on there. Uh, we used about 50 lines of code. And then we came up with this really innovative control system. And that innovative control system was um, using our cell phone with uh, Skype technology to both see, to put eyes on the rover, and then on our, on our laptops we could see where the rover was and where it was going, and, um, and to control its movement using flashcards on our camera. So it's a kind of a sophisticated thing, <laughs> very lightly sophisticated thing. But then we took our students into this space. Now think about this. These are my students in a human rights course. These are students who came to Mount Holyoke who are interested in the humanities and social sciences. They're not interested in STEM. In fact, they're very nervous about STEM, which is why they're in my classes. <laughs> so um, little did they know they were going to get some, tech, some engineering and some coding. So we took the students into the makerspace, and they did this. They built these drones, and then we did a simulation uh, where the simulation was they had to go into the Kendade atrium, deploy the drones. These are rovers. Again, they're like, so. And the concept was they had to get from point A to point B. They were in a different location, so they couldn't see the drones physically. They could just review them through their computers. And it was to deploy humanitarian relief was the simulation from, from the staging ground to uh, where the humanitarian relief was in need. Now, we did this at lunchtime, and I wasn't fully aware of this, but it turned out that there are a lot of students in there at lunchtime. <laughs> they were looking around saying, what are these things? They were picking them up. They were looking. <laughs> I had completely lost control of the, of the classroom, and the students were frustrated. My students were frustrated because they couldn't control the human interface with this technology from a remote location. Now... As it turns out, the impact of that was profound. The students and the reflection on this was, wow, when you deploy remote technologies, you can't control the interface with human beings on the other side of the planet. That was a powerful lesson. I could have given them an essay. This was something that really resonated. But the other thing about this, as we talk through this, this cost, this unit, this throne that we built, that each of them had an ability to construct in the art building, cost about forty dollars total. That throne can be placed anywhere on the planet that has a Wi-Fi signal or a cell signal, and we can park that thing anywhere under a table, under a anywhere, we can park it for months and fire it up when we want to. The concept of this technology, its cost, it's the democratization of the technology, its access to anybody on the planet for all kinds of purposes, surveillance, right, powerful, powerful capabilities to help people, but also powerful capabilities the concept that we had, we, we had that level of reflection in the classroom after this to understand, wow, this technology can do amazing things, but it can also do some really freaky things. <laughs> and so we had some really sophisticated conversations. Now, I cite that as an example because it's my, it's my personal example of taking students into this makerspace and doing something very powerful in a learning environment. It's called experiential learning, project-based, object-based, team-based learning. This is a concept we are permeating across the institution so that it's not just lecture format that's happening in the learning experience for our students. Our students are coming at questions and challenges of the world through all kinds of new innovative technology. We have invested in a teaching and learning initiative to help support our faculty to do this work. 
we have a librarian sta a staff in the research instructional support unit of the library where liaisons for each, um, each division and each department are assigned uh, to help support faculty as they do this work. As we build this maker space, the Maker and Innovation Lab uh, in Prospect Hall, this will be a state-of-the-art 8,000 square foot facility to allow hundreds of students, thousands of students each year to do some kind of similar work. This, in my case, was a particular module for two weeks in a particular course. We will have that concept of modules. We'll also have concepts of full courses over there. So we'll have a wide variation of student experiences in that, in that space. And that's the second phase of the Sherman Fairchild Grant. And the third phase of the Sherman Fairchild Grant is technology and film and media production and media studies. And if there's one thing we're pretty confident about, the concept of media literacy in the world today, and how media is produced, not just in film, but also in content, uh, is something that we're, we're, we're highly attentive to. So what constitutes discourse and civil discourse and knowledge and fact, those are things that we understand are, are incredibly important for our students to navigate as the new technologies, social technologies, social media technologies are out there. What does it mean to interface in these technologies? So the third phase will be the film and media production. Now that's just an example of a number of initiatives that we have ongoing. I see Sally Donner over here. I want to thank Sally. We have a, a new program in, in Washington, D.C. that we're piloting this, this fall. It's been very successful, so thank you, Sally. Um, uh, Marcy, 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 thank you. <laughs> uh, I've been talking to Marcy and, and uh, Sally. Uh, well, actually, they came to see me, I think, my first week on the job. Um, and asked about this, but we're piloting that this 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 fall, uh, the students actually just met with the speaker uh, with uh, with spe uh, former speaker Pelo Nancy Pelosi, who was a, uh, an honorary member of the class of 2018 at Mount Holyoke. So they met with her last week, um, uh, and that course that program is being run by uh, Professor Calvin Chen out of our politics department, and we're very excited about it. What is it? It's a MHC semester in DC. So it is a uh, internship research intensive semester for our, our students. So we've taken five students down there. They are uh, housed at the University of California's uh, uh, residential facility. Uh, they are taking a full set of 12 credits of courses and a, and a full-time full internship for the academic semester. So it's a great program. We're piloting to see how it works. Yeah. Engage in public policy. For every discipline, there is a public policy discipline, whether it's mm -hmm. advocacy, whether it's ethics. Yes. Uh, how is the college really looking at this in all the academic settings? Because you can no, no longer work in isolation. So we have been working with the faculty on public engagement, uh, both in their professional growth and development, and uh, through our new teaching and learning initiative. Um, uh, that is run by Liz Markovitz, who's a professor of politics. That program is, um, has been very successful uh, in getting our faculty to learn how to, how to, to write op-eds, how to translate highly complex science, uh, um, uh, scientific discovery, or um, you know, kind of innovative theoretical things. How do we apply this to the challenges and to be, to be engaged publicly? Um, we have, so we're doing this through, through professional growth and development in, in, in our, um, in our uh, teaching and learning initiative. We also are hiring faculty and one of the, the in, 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 I, I meet every candidate that comes through, through campus. And one of the things that I'm interested in is, one, why do they want to be here at this institution? Not, not just get a job, but why do they want to be teaching at Mount Holyoke? But also, how do they think that they, they want to be a liberal arts professor meaning that they're really engaged in the success of our students, but also uh, being a liberal arts professor means we have to be out there telling our story aggressively. And so that means to be publicly engaged. So we have, uh, we have a couple of searches that, uh, that we're excited about this year in particular, and one of the things that's embedded in the, in, the, in the core description is somebody who will come in and take a leadership in public engagement uh, in those fields. 
other piece of that, how do we integrate public policy issues within a course in art? I mean, I was I was talking with some folks, and with art, we used to be in the studios creating art. We never recognized the impact of the national endowment and how that funding funds art. How do we become also advocates as students and alumni for the kind of there is always a nexus of public policy in life. And how do we have kids leave here understanding they don't work in the lab and that there's always going to be a public policy interest in them to work in the lab? So we're doing a lot of co-curricular leadership programming, and I think that's embedded in this through the Weissman Center um, and through Student Affairs and Weissman Center for Leadership is working very collaboratively with our student life on a whole set of of co-curricular activities, and and in profession, I think in, in in the conversations with our faculty about how to uh, about thinking about the impact of the liberal arts more generally on society. So those conversations we've been having with the faculty to bring these these elements into the classroom. Sometimes it's done explicitly, sometimes not. Uh, sometimes the faculty don't do it, um, but we're working I think across the institution. Um, we all recognize that. That the and, and I think also the, the the kind of trying to develop the interdisciplinarity, the kind of multidisciplinary approach is really part of this to show that every element of a student's trajectory after they leave the institution is going to be um, is going to be connected um, to the world around them. So it's really thinking about how is our education connected to the world, not you know this is. Part of our mission statement is to be in a purposeful engagement in the world. That's part of it, is to understand um, our responsibilities, our, our um, uh, uh, you know, kind of engagement with the world around us and preparing students for that. I think also just the internship and the link process does a lot of work on that. So it, it is connecting. And one of the things that is distinctive about Mount Holyoke is uh, I'm the vice president for academic affairs. Um, and the, direct, the, the, the Career Development Center reports to me. Uh, in most other institutions, the Career Development Center is separate from the Academic Affairs Division. What we did when we, when we established the link is we made, that, we made that effort to move CDC into the Academic Affairs Division. So Liz Learman reports to me. Um, we work very closely with academic departments so that we're trying to embed the curriculum to career not as not career preparation and career adv advising as a separate thing, uh, maybe coming out of student life in most other institutions, but it's actually integrated into what we're doing. The, coal, you know, the, the, the key thing here is, is that we want our students to be prepared for a world that is, that is going to be complex and changing, as I said. But we also want them to be able to be and see the and make the change that they want to see in the world, whatever path they, they take. And so, um, in order for that to happen, we know they have to be financially empowered, and to be financially empowered, they have to be insured. So, I would say that, you know, when I arrived on campus 20 years ago, the faculty felt like, well, career preparation and CDC work was separate from what they do. Um, I came from a career at the State Department and government before coming into academia. Um, I don't see that disconnect um, in much the same way that our faculty used to. Our current faculty don't see that either. Um, and one of the things that's been really powerful for them is to connect with all of you. Um, we have a new uh, initiative in our, in, our, um, in our department websites where we've asked our departments to go out and curate stories with the Alumni Association. Um, and Nancy has been doing an incredible amount of work with our, with our academic departments telling your stories so that's, and, and profiling them on our department website. Now that's powerful for our students so they can tell that, that when they major in something, there isn't necessarily a linear track for them, uh, that there's all kinds of opportunities that are available to them. But it's a powerful validation for our faculty as well to see that their, their former students have gone on and have done absolutely amazing things that we didn't anticipate given you know, what the career track might have looked like uh, when you all graduated. That validation is really critical and it's empowering. And it also means that the faculty are much more engaged in, in conversations with students about career preparation. 
And we do know from the Student Conference Committee's annual um, survey that the number one place they look for, for advice on everything is from the PAC. Uh, on career advice, in, in, you know, they, they look for advice from, from the faculty. So we've, we're, we've worked hard. Liz Learman has done an amazing job at CDC to engage our faculty in, this, in, in helping to support them uh, to have these conversations, and that's been critical. Other questions? Lots of questions, yeah. Inclusion of Western civilization in the curriculum. It's, it's in the curriculum. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's embedded throughout. Uh, I mean, uh, we, yeah, I'm not, I mean, there's a lot of different emphasis um, at different points, but we are, we are a liberal arts college. Our English department, we teach Shakespeare, we teach, you know, our political theory courses are all start in the foundations of, of uh, well, I will say that we're more inclusive than we ever have been before, uh, but all we're doing is adding conceptions of, of, of political theory, and, but the, uh, you know, the, lack of a better word, the canon is, is deeply embedded. We're always changing um, and evolving, but, um, but it's, it's present uh, throughout. I mean, scientific method and discovery is all, is all rooted in, in um, uh, particular forms of trajectories. I teach human rights. Human rights is a, comes out of the Enlightenment, but I teach it within the context of a much deeper understanding of, of the pluralism of, of, of the broad range of, of religious, moral, and ethical traditions that, um, that far exceed the Enlightenment. So uh, they might not have been articulated in a concept, concept of rights, more in communal uh, duties and responsibilities, but clearly we're engaged in, in, a, in, a, in a curriculum that's embedded. I had a question related to the innovation in makerspace. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if the college has any plans to help students who are making inventions or innovations help commercialize their products, so take them more from a research stage to a pilot stage to actually launch them and commercialize them. Yeah, so we're looking at, so a couple of things that we're doing on that. We're, we're, um, we're developing an intellectual property policy on this. So um, in our science labs, uh, intellectual property in most institutions is held by the institution. In our art uh, studios, most intellectual property or creative, uh, creative expression uh, is, um, uh, is uh, held by the artist. So in the Maker and Innovation Lab, we're working through some of, the, some of the dynamics of that. So intellectual property is a piece of that. So if something is, is developed, then my sense is it'll be, you know, it will privilege the, the, the creator in that space. Um, the other piece of this is uh, seed money for potential innovation. Um, we've looked at different models for that. We're continuing to review that. But um, whether that happens on campus, during a student's educational experience, or once they leave the, the campus and may need some space and some support, institutions have some different models on that. We're looking at, at some different models, but we haven't made a, a decision. That's part of the conversation as we're, as we're bringing this online. I see we have time for one more question, so. Um, you referred a couple of times to a new or expanded makerspace in Prospect Hall. Are you, you're talking about the dorm? The dining area. The dining area. Yeah, could, so you just, could you just explain that a little bit? 8,000 square feet? Yeah, so the dining facility in the kitchen in Prospect Hall. So when we moved to the community center, one of the, one of the benefits to the institution was opportunity space. So we have eight, um, re eight residence halls which have uh, dining facilities and kitchens that have closed uh, as we've moved. And by the way, that is a special place. That is a game changer for this institution. Uh, I go over there around 11 o'clock in the evening that space is used. Um, we, we, we do about 450 meals after 9 o'clock. Um, that's swipes. Um, 
But students are in there. They're engaged in that space, um, it, and they are loving it. Now, there's some lines at, at different points, and we've, we've adjusted the academic schedule to create more space. Um, but what, uh, so I just want to say that that was, that was an amazing, I mean, it, that is, that's a game changer for us. Our community uh, <clears throat> and, our, and the fact that our students are in that space literally you know, 15 hours, 18 hours a day, it's, it's, it's really impressive. Um, but it's given us an opportunity to use the space that has been vacated. Uh, so Ham and McGregor, uh, we've got quite a bit of space over there. Um, Prospect, that dining space is 8,000 square feet when you take the kitchen out. Uh, that is completely gutted as of today. We just did a tour of it yesterday. Com construction is scheduled to be completed by Thanksgiving. We will be in there with classes in the, in the spring term. Uh, we have 25 faculty members participating uh, in the development, the design and development of that space and the programming of that space. Uh, that's, that's an awful lot of faculty, and they're, they're faculty from the sciences, from the social sciences, from the humanities, and from the creative and performing arts. So one of the things that we're very, very excited about on the Maker and Innovation Lab is that it is a space that is not in a science center. This is not just going to bring science students who are predisposed to engineering. This is a space that's going to be used by the community across. And so what we're super excited about is this is the same model that we have with our teaching and art, by the way. Um, where we have, um, uh, what was the number, Cassandra, that we saw yesterday? Um, over a thousand students. So 3,200 student visits to the art museum and are teaching an art concept across 34 academic disciplines. So what we're trying to do when we do this work is not just take students predisposed to museum studies or art into the art museum, but, and I've taken my students from propaganda and war into the art museum to look at ancient Roman coins um, uh, to see representations of the state and masculinity uh, uh, and representation of, of the Roman uh, state. Anyway, just the point there is, is that the concepts that we're trying to develop here are infusing this kind of experiential learning across the institution and not just in siloed uh, academic departments and disciplines. 25 faculty members are participating in the, in the academic, in the, in the maker space. I see my time is up. I could go on. I really, I, I'm, I'm, pr I'm pretty excited, but. Uh, and, and I'm gonna say, I think we owe a great thanks. I think we owe a great thanks to John. I mean, every time I hear him speak, I'm more and more confident that today's students are able to survive, thrive, and lead in a constantly changing environment. So thank you so much. We, we just have a small bit of housekeeping for those of you who really need that third, fourth, fifth cup of coffee. Um, there's some in the executive lounge right out there. Our next session starts at 10.30 in Cleveland L2. For most of us in this room, with the exception of the young alums, uh, the young alumni sessions, alumni sessions are in Ken Day 203, so my guess is you can follow Casey Accardi and friends to that session. Uh, the one thing I wanted to mention or have been asked to mention, we are going to split up after the session in um, Cleveland L2. So for those of you who are reunion planners and potentially here alone or want to, might want to sit in the back um, because you'll be starting your session in Cleveland L1 at 1120 while those of us um, who are in the Mount Holyoke Fund volunteers will be remaining in L2. But if you want to sit with your class, please do so. No one is going to scream. Uh, there are shuttles for anyone who doesn't want to make the trek or to take the elevator 
um, through the art building, uh, the art museum, which I tend to do. Uh, there are shuttles leaving from lower lot, uh, the lower lot in Prospect. The lower lot in Prospect, so there's no need to take the stairs or an elevator from here if you would like shuttle accommodation. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to ask any one of us with a tag or not. Thank you.